Hello everybody. Today we're going to look at a trajectory problem. This problem is on the more complex end of things. I'm going to go ahead and summarize the problem for us. So there's a boy that is throwing snowballs. The boy is going to launch a snowball. It's going to travel in a parabolic path as we would expect it to. We're going to ignore air resistance. And they're trying to get it onto the top of some building which is some distance away. Now we're told a bunch about the distances. We know that the boy is standing 16.2 meters away from the building. We also know that the building itself is 8.3 meters tall. And we are told that the object, the snowball in this case, is going to actually be released from the boy's hand 1.9 meters above the ground. In this problem, we're going to go ahead and assign a 16 meter per second velocity for the initial velocity of this ball. That's not necessarily at any particular angle, so some generic angle theta. And what we're looking at in this problem and what makes it so interesting is we want to actually see what range of angles theta would it be possible for the boy to get on top of the roof? And I'm actually going to turn to Excel later on in this video and show different parameters and you'll be able to actually see the launch trajectory. So we'll actually use the software to identify what angles would actually get the ball on top of the rooftop. For now I'm going to clear some space and let's get started on the problem. With any trajectory problem like this it's going to be really useful to first start with the initial velocity vector that's at some angle theta, but that's not going to be as useful to me as it would if I knew something about the components. And so I actually really want to know what is the velocity of this particular object in the x direction and what is the initial velocity in the y direction. This is a right angle here. So what we can do is we can go through and we can use trigonometry for this. I can identify that it is the sine function that would allow me to relate v this vertical wall with the hypotenuse. And I can say that vi times sine of theta is actually equal to the initial velocity in the y direction. So this is still actually a vyi, initial velocity. And we can look at what the initial velocity is in the x direction and we will find that it is the cosine function that's going to relate this for us. In the problem statement, we are told that this is 16 meters per second. So while it's true that I could give this VI right here a 16, uh, as well as the VI on the vertical wall, I'm going to just leave it for now. From here, I'm going to go ahead and write down some functions that are going to describe the position of a ball as a function of time. In the y dimension, I have a general function that looks like this. The position as a function of time is going to be 1 half a t squared plus v i times t plus d i. Now I'm doing this, as I stated before, for the y direction. That means that a in the y, for example, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. v i in the y is a value that I just solved for generically, which was v i times sine of theta di in the y initially is going to be the height that the ball was released. We were told in the problem statement that that was 1.9 meters. For now I'm going to plug in this negative 9.8 because that won't change. The boy is always throwing from 1.9 meters. I'll go ahead and plug that in. So here's my expression. d in the y as a function of time is going to be equal to negative 4.9, that's in meters per second squared, but that's times time squared plus v initial is this full vi in the y sine theta. This full quantity is going to be multiplied by time plus 1.9 meters. So we will leave this alone for just a moment and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a similar expression for what's going on in the x direction. Certainly in the x direction, the acceleration is equal to zero. There's nothing that is causing the ball to speed up or slow down in the horizontal. Again, we are going to go ahead and ignore air resistance. When I have acceleration equal to zero, it's very nice that this term up here collapses to zero. So in the x direction, I can write this function, that d in the x as a function of time is going to be equal to v initial which I had solved over here, 
was V I cosine theta that quantity multiplied by time plus di. I'm going to go ahead and define that as far as the horizontal is concerned the position of the boy is zero. Okay I'm going to clear a little space and what I'm going to do the approach that I'm going to take is I am going to exchange the fact that right now my functions are written as a function of time. I'm going to exchange that for the x position here. I'm doing this because I'm asked to find this range of angles that the object will be launched at. And it is just a fact that as I change the angles, I'm going to wildly change how the ball is going to behave as a function of time. I'm going to fix this problem to the what is the y position as a function of the x position. So I'm going to solve this expression for t, which means that I need to divide this quantity over. And I'm going to find that t is going to be equal to dx. I'm going to drop the function notation for that low spot. Divided by vi cosine theta. Remember the power of this here. This vi that I just listed, that is the hypotenuse. That is the initial velocity. And in, in this problem statement, it was the 16 meters per second. Remember, I am dealing with the x direction right now. However, the cosine theta that is written here is the thing that is allowing me to convert the hypotenuse and speak of it in terms of just the x component. So now this time is going to get replaced up here, there and there. So now I'll come up here in blue, and this can get a little long, so I'll start way over here. dy, and ultimately this is actually going to be a function of dx for me. And again, I know I'm leaving some things as variables, but that's going to be my true variable that I'm going to graph this up by. It's going to be equal to negative 4.9. Now I need t, and it's going to be squared. Well, this is dx divided by vi cosine theta. That full quantity is squared plus vi sine theta which is dx divided by vi cosine theta. And now I'm going to add my 1.9. So if you look, all I have done is I've replaced my t's with this thing that is a dx. So again, let me clear some board space. And now I'm going to go through a simplification step here. And this is a little big, so I'm going to again start way over here. So here's my function, and it's going to be equal to, I'm going to have a numerator and a denominator. I've got negative 4.9 times dx squared. I've distributed that in. Then I have vi squared cosine squared theta. Plus, notice that I have this vi canceling with that one. That's kind of nice. And also, there's a trig identity, which remember here that sine theta over cosine theta, that is equal to sine is opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse plural, hypotenuses or whatever it is, cancel each other and I'm left with the opposite over adjacent. That is equal to tangent theta. So there's this identity that sine theta over cosine theta is actually equal to tangent theta. It's very useful for me here because I have a sine theta in the numerator and a cosine theta in the denominator. Okay, so I also have this dx that's sitting there though. So I'm going to say plus dx times tangent of theta plus 1.9. Okay, so here's my overall big nasty looking function and what I'm doing and the reason why I'm leaving these particular choice variables as variables, namely the vi, I never plugged in a number, the theta, I never plugged in a number, and the dx is going to be the thing that I'm going to graph against here, at least initially. So I want to be able to play with all those things. Now I'm going to turn your attention to Excel. Okay, now we're looking at an Excel spreadsheet that I've obviously already made in advance. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and generated a whole list of DXs. So the horizontal distance that's going to take me all the way out to my building. So the red over here is the building itself. And I just simply made that by defining a few points. I defined a vertical line and then a horizontal that is at the height that I actually want the ball to go.
Then in here, this is me defining that big function that we just had written. So this is something you got to be really careful when you're typing this in. You've got all these parentheses that are hanging around. But I have left this so that I can vary the angle here and I can also vary the initial velocity. So when we look at this, this provides a great visual for here's the ball going up. Remember the boy launches it from 1.9 meters. It goes up, it starts to come back down, and then look, it's going to hit the side of the building. This was not a successful launch for the boy. If the boy were to throw this ball a little bit higher, say 40 degrees, you can say they're making some progress. And so the boy is creeping up here, getting a little bit further. I'll come down, let's make this 45 degrees doesn't look like the boy is making it. Remember, I really wanted this to be a variable, the initial velocity, so that we could see how that works. Certainly, conceptually, you must understand that if you were to throw it faster, it's going to go further. So if I came and changed this to 20 meters per second, uh, clearly they're able to throw this over the side of the building. If I come down and I change it to, say, 12, like I had well, that's just not going to make it. That, do, that barely makes it to the building itself, almost still hits the ground. So you can see that this really helps me understand how all of this works. But I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to put in that original 16 meters per second. So the original problem said, what is the range of angles? 45 doesn't cut it. If I go to 50 degrees, it looks like that will work. You see it just auto-scaled, but 50 degrees is going to be good enough. Somewhere between 45 and 50. We're going to narrow that in just a little bit. If I start to go too far, so here's 60 degrees, it's still okay. 65 degrees. Looks like it's just barely going to land on the top, but I'm really wasting a lot of this throw going so high in the air and then it's just barely coming down. If I went to 70 degrees, it looks like I'm going to miss again. So I, I went too high on this. So there's clearly a range. So now what I'm going to do is I've also done the same thing, but I've done it for the angle. And so this takes a little while to calibrate yourself to. This is not the same type of graph. This visual is not the arc of the ball going. What I'm doing is I've changed it to where I've said no matter what, we are only looking at one particular spot. So we are looking at the horizontal distance of 16.2. I'm looking at this mark right here. So let's go back to this. No matter what, I'm only looking at that one horizontal distance where it's out there. And that happens to be the 16.2 meters where the building is. I still have that same initial velocity that I had before. And what I've done is I've swapped it out. Instead of having dx down here, now I have a function of theta. So I am looking for any angles that can possibly send this thing with this initial velocity above the 8.3 meter tall building. And you can come in here and you can see that I have a point right there that is 47 degrees. So that would go above. Any of these possible angles here will launch the ball above. And then there's this one over here that says 65 degrees is good. However, 66 degrees is not good. But by the way, this is still that same generic function that I had. All I did was I changed my cell designations for where Excel is going to be able to find these numbers. Now I made dx one fixed quantity that's right there. And I went through and I let the angles change. And that goes all the way down to 90 degrees. So this is how software can certainly help you out. One last time, we're going to go here. We're going to see that 47, we're going to call that and about 65. 47 to 65 degrees should clear it. So let's go to 47. This should hit right on the corner. Looks like it does. We can go up above that. We would be clear. So we're definitely getting on top of the building. And remember, 65 degrees was our other limit. So if I go to 63, definitely making it. And if I go to 65, that's my limit right there. So this is one way that you could go about doing that. I wanted this visual. Certainly, another thing that you can do is you can go in and you can use your calculator and actually graph functions. You could graph up this function, and then you could ask your calculator, where's the exact intersection between these things? can give you a much higher precision. So this is a, like I said, on the higher end of complexity for 
uh, a trajectory problem, but hopefully that made sense to you, and if it did, you should certainly let your computer know.